here for uh, joining us for this Museum Midday. Uh, so we were really excited uh, you know, this last couple of months to see some of the research and photos and things that are coming out um, of the research that uh, Peace Health Ketchikan has done into their 100th year, uh, yeah. their centennial celebration. Um, and so we're really excited to have uh, Kate Govars with yep. us here from Peace Health, Ket Peace Health Ketchikan uh, Medical Center. Um, and she's going to share not only the documentary that kind of came out of this uh, project, but also how they approached such a monumental task uh, and you know how it might apply too to other civic organizations or businesses that themselves are trying to mark their occasion. Uh, so we'll hand things off to Kate and um, we'll have time for questions at the end. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Erica Jane. Hi folks, um, pleasure to share this with you. Um, this is uh, a really fun uh, project that I have been kind of gifted, um, not really by choice, um, <laughs> but it's become a, a passion project of mine to kind of dive into our history. Um, the reason I've taken on this, my, my role at the hospital, I'm the marketing and communications manager, and I started in that role in August of 2020, so kind of in the thick of COVID. Um, and in about 2021 or so, um, our chaplain at the time, Margie Adams, said, oh, the centennial's coming. And I said, the centennial? <laughs> Do tell me more. Uh, and she kind of started feeding this narrative of Peace Health had been here for, or what is now known as Peace Health had been here for the last 100 years. And so we're starting to, I was like, okay. So started to kind of dive into our records, hey, let's see, um, and, and look into it. and. Um, my predecessor's roles in like the 75th anniversary in 1998, those kind of came out of the marketing and communication office. Um, and so that's kind of how I got roped into it. Uh, but I've told a number of people, I could not do the work that we have done with this project had it not been for the story and the mission and the spirit behind it. Um, this is just, I was sharing um, just a, a moment ago how inspiring the founding sisters are and and how kind of surprising that process has been because these sisters, while they might be, I'm not Catholic, so um, the concept of being rooted in Catholicism seemed pretty stark to me. I, I don't know a lot about the Catholic Church, um, but looking into the founding sisters and then the work that the sisters did up here in Ketchikan, they're pretty radical feminists in a lot of ways. Um, and they did some really, progressive work and some of their mission and their goals was, um, as you'll see in the documentary, Sister Andrea will say, they, um, the sisters went to where there was need and they served the needs of the people in, in the needs that they had, not in what the sisters wanted to do. And, and you see that resonate over and over. And the founding sister um, really saw a need to serve uh, women and children, um, ensuring that women had rights to uh, resources, access to vote, access to own property. Um, and so some of that just, that mission and that tradition carried on into the legacy that they serve today. And then throughout the documentary process, you see a lot of this just deep interconnection between the work of the hospital and the care of the caregivers and then the support and the the rallying of the community and that symbiotic relationship I argue has made both more or less fr thrive um, we've had a really robust healthcare system um, that's allowed us to have really um, aggressive industries, um, really traumatic industries like fishing and logging. Um, but then our healthcare system would only be what it is with the philanthropic support of the of donors and then the um, recognition of the city of Ketchikan to say, hey, we are, we are going to continue to support this mission and make sure we have a robust healthcare facility so that our community can continue to do the work that we're doing so that we can be healthy and move forward. And so it's just that interrelationship started back in 1923 and carries on to today. Um, and so that makes me excited about the work, right? If it was just like a, a for-profit healthcare that we're just trying to like put money in people's pockets, that's not fun to tell that story. Um, but this story has been really fun to tell. And um, I hope you take a chance. So um, around the room uh, are these historic panels that we've put together. I'll talk a little bit about the creation of these. Um, and a little bit about kind of some of the stories behind it. Um, but I'll also share a little bit about the, the process of uncovering this history and how, um, how much is left un, unsaid 
um, because I think that's a, when you're digging out 100 years of history, you're gonna miss a lot um, unless you're focused entirely on that, which I have not had the luxury of doing. So anyway, um, not to belabor this much more, we're gonna dive into, um, many of you have seen this already. Uh, I have seen it more um, than a few times and still get inspired by it. But this is a 10 minute documentary that just kind of highlights some of that history and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more and, and offer some question time. On a small island in southeast Alaska, we've been able to develop a healthcare system that provides exceptional world-class care. The Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace were founded in 1884. The idea of the community from the very start was to go where there was need and to serve in the ways that the people needed and wanted. They came across the sea to the east coast. They came across the continent to the west coast. They then came forward up north to Alaska. Ketchikan, which is an island community, needed a hospital. So we sent three sisters, one from England, one from the east, and one from the west, to staff a hospital in Ketchikan, Alaska, which was opened in 1923. You know, they were forward thinkers. When they handed out their little ticket, and for $10, that logger could get health care for a year, it was pretty innovative. The sisters have been such a big part of the growth of health care here. The Bodden Street Hospital served the community very well for, for a number of years. By the 60s, the standards for a hospital had changed greatly. Building codes had changed greatly. Very expensive. So it was worked out that the city, because they wanted a hospital, would build the building and the sisters would run the business in the hospital. They understood the value of having the sisters here. So they created a unique facility amongst all the Peace Health facilities where we're owned and belong to the, the community, but Peace Health manages it. I'm very thankful to the hospital and to the nun because they didn't discriminate. They never turned anybody away. With their strength and determination and tenacity and commitment to our community, this is what, why we have what we have today. As industry came around, so did the need for more medical services and Peace Health stepped up. Whether it be the Coast Guard, timber, fishing, mining, um, air travel, uh, and then tourism. In most places, in Alaska when the mining or the fishing or the timber you know has a downturn or collapses uh, the town goes away. Ketchikan has stubbornly stayed here and I think the fact that we have a full-service medical center has been a major facet in our ability to weather those different storms. Now we have the cruise industry when you get 1.3 million people coming into your community you're gonna have some health care issues. Ketchikan is truly fortunate to have a hospital of this caliber in a community this size. It just doesn't happen throughout the United States. One of the things that the sisters were able to do for the community is bring in services that as a community we would not be able to afford. For the small hospital that it is, it has extraordinary services available to the community. We're really fortunate to have a facility that we have with the services that we offer. I think if you go anywhere else in the lower 48 that's on a road system with a community our size, you would never see a facility that has the types of equipment we have. Practically every need that members of the community have for medical services can be provided here. You don't have that in Oregon or Washington. You'd have to drive 100 miles, 50 miles, 150 miles to find the care that, that we have here. What is very different about being in Ketchikan, Ketchikan is on an island, and that makes a huge difference in what's available and how quickly it is available. 
We are all here, and whatever the issue is, we have to resolve it here. And the hospital is a very strong part of that. You know, over the decades, the community and the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace and, and now Peace Health have created a very large, very well-functioning, relatively comprehensive hospital for this isolated area. We can't just get on a, in an ambulance, you know, and go a half an hour or an hour to the next facility. So the fact that we're remote, you only can get here by boat or plane, I think has been the impetus for the hospital growing to the level it had. The hospital here is one of the best trauma hospitals anywhere because over decades they've had to deal with that. You know, the fishing industry, the timber industry, the mining industry. These are all industries that unfortunately led themselves to trauma, serious trauma, life-threatening trauma. When you're an island community, when there is a crisis, when somebody is in need, people reach out and work together. What I have seen over the years is the rallying um, for people who are in times of need. And I think that's just the community spirit of coming together and um, trying to help one another. It's a very self-reliant community. We have to be. Alaskans are very generous. We're very hardworking, entrepreneurial. It is a way of life for the people there. When there have been needs, the people respond and the philanthropy has been really a huge, huge part of the ministry in Ketchikan. The fact that the community at pretty much every opportunity has stepped up and said, we will pay for that, uh, saying it's worth it to us to continue to upgrade that facility to something that is very valuable to us and, and, and we're willing to spend that money. But it takes a lot for the hospital to run. Everyone who's a part of that group has an important role to play. Um, and not everybody is a doctor or a nurse, but they're still supporting healthcare in this community and they're still supporting the hospital and the clinic and our community. We are local people, you know, and, and a lot of our physicians, you know, come in and they get involved in the community and we get to know each other. And so there's just that little extra special touch, you know, it's a small town. They've helped out with Little League, they've helped out with nonprofits, the Arts Council, First City Players. There's a lot of interconnection in this community. We're a small community, but um, when you're in a hospital and, and you're getting care, it's not uncommon for you to know the person that's working on you from an experience in the community. So I can remember as a kid that uh, the nursing staff uh, was, uh, you know, my friend next door's mom. I've been in Ketchikan long enough to have taken care of everybody twice. I've taken care of the kid twice, his mother twice, his grandmother three times, and his great-grandmother four times. <laughs> there were many people who worked at the hospital who supported their families because the hospital was there. So that's one of the things I really want people to remember is that it wasn't just a job. It was the nuns caring about their employees and helping us. The uh, Ketchikan community is blessed with Peace Health. It's the history that we have with Peace Health. They understand the community, they know the people. We can live here. We can go about our, our, our jobs and our play and whatever else it is, knowing that the hospital has our back. That there are a couple hundred really qualified healthcare workers at that facility who all know their jobs. Peace Health has been able to serve this community like no other organization would choose to do it. I think it's been a great partnership that's you know, gone on for decades, that's really community driven. This hospital care will continue in Ketchikan. They will continue it with love. What I love best is love returned, laughter shared and friendship earned. To give love truly and receive is life's sweet purpose, I believe. I love Ernie's. That's, I said that at the, uh, at the 
event that we hosted in February, but um, he's just such a great embodiment of a lot of the providers at Peace Health and the caregivers there. And, um, and this video is obviously like, I, as I'm sitting here thinking, like I get, get warm fuzzies watching it, but I also recognize my role. And that's one of the things that I think is interesting about this whole process is obviously this is a subjective piece of work. Right, it is a feel-good story about the hospital, um, and and I recognize that in the in the historic uncovering, and that was one of the things that I wanted to kind of talk through. I, I welcome questions. I don't have like a big formal um, talk for y'all uh, today. Most of it is just kind of, as I was telling Erica Jane, a bit of a pontification of of our historic process, and what I recognized as I was working with Erica Brown, just how deeply subjective this process has been. I'm the PR person for the hospital. We're going to put anything out here in a, in a positive light. Um, but as I said in my, in my intro, almost everything that I've come across within our history has been very largely positive. Certainly we're part of a healthcare system in the, in the country that has deep flaws, like we all know that. Um, and Peace Health's not immune to the, the flaws of a national healthcare process. Um, and so a lot of the issues I personally have within um, getting healthcare is just a issue I had when I lived in Portland or an issue I had when I lived in Connecticut or North Carolina. It's not any different up here. Um, what is different up here is, is the people who live and work here are also such a like embodiment of our community, right? Like I'm a community member. I live here. I'm committed to catch can. I'm not going anywhere. And, and that's what a lot of my colleagues are as well. And similarly for those of you, like you all have jobs here, um, you might not like everything that your organization does, but the, but you feel some sort of connection to that because of the work that we do in our community. So yes, this process was subjective and also um, in many ways very superficial. And that's one of the things that I, I have had a little bit of a challenge with trying to tell this story. Like Erica Brown brought forth to me today some amazing photos that are from the 50s from when an iron lung got brought to town and it, um, the nuns were training on it. Um, and that was during the era of polio. Um, and I have some content about, like this is um, from uh, the polio um, March of Dimes fundraiser. So I've got some content on there. But there's still so much more to dig up, um, and there's only so much time. So for organizations that are going through this, like we have a number of organizations, like I think um, Tonga sto um, stores are almost 100 years very quickly, and there's a few others that are nearing their 100th anniversary, and it's how do you even start to tell that story. The hospital is a little bit fortunate because it made the news a lot um, for every um, for every major disaster or for every um, expansion, we made the news. And so there's a lot to pull on. So we pulled on a lot of news uh, sources. Uh, the museum had a wealth of resources within that. So I reached out to the newspaper, reached out to the museum. The newspaper said, hey, talk to the museum. And the museum here, you all had so much depth for us to kind of start with. Um, and that's, that's really where the documentary was rooted in is we started digging out a timeline of sorts uh, over um, pulling out an article. I think the first article we found is on this um, thing that it's, it is the article from February 22nd, 1923 that says new hospital blessed by the bishop today. And that was where we, we started. That was our like, that's 1923, that's our 100 years, which is why we held an event on February 22nd, 2023, um, based on that newspaper article. And we started putting the pieces together from there. Um, and there were different highlights of different times that really came out. The mid-50s was a big time. There was kind of a lull in the 70s and 80s. So we don't have a lot of content. Um, and then more uh, current or contemporary content we have. Um, but it's, there's a point at which you have to stop and actually produce. So I had a deadline of February. We started working on this almost exactly a year ago. So mid-March um, mid of 2022, um, I brought together a committee. We started talking about what we wanted to do, started talking about a documentary. Um, with a documentary, you need content. So started diving into the, the depths of the museum's archives, Peace Health's archives, and drew out a little bit of the storyline. Um, but then we set a deadline of February 22nd for an event that we were going to host. So 
things that were due were these panels and the documentary. And, and so driving forward, I had to have a hard stop on, on when we could add more content to that. And um, the next hard stop I have is we're gonna take these panels and turn them into a wall display and create a museum exhibit within the hospital that shares some of the story and in a similar format. Uh, but I'm asking Erica, ooh, I want those new photos. Can I get them? And Erica's like, ah. Oh. I thought I was done with her. Um, <laughs> so it's, I think that that's an interesting, interesting thought process is I also reached out to the community, but very limitedly about um, getting other people's photos. Um, like this photo of these nuns um, on a boat, I think came from Clara Diaz. Yep, um, and that was in Black Sands Beach um, where there was oftentimes just, um, a fair bit of uh, picnicking that happened, even nuns in their habits uh, rowing around, which I think is really neat, but there's so much more of that that I didn't get a chance to uncover. And um, in two years when people were saying, why didn't you do X? And I'm like, I didn't have X to do. So uh, yeah, I think that's that's an interesting, like take that for what what you will, but it's, that's the perpetual challenge. And I think that's the challenge that the museum probably has as well as um, how much do you uncover? When do you stop? Because the story is never over. And those who tell the story are telling a very like one-sided view of it. Um, so yeah, um, questions, thoughts, things you want to know? Uh, yeah, just a question for you. So sure. you mentioned the museum's archive. What kind of material or things were you finding in the hospital's archive? Sure, the hospital's archive um, started with uh, Tim Walker's brain. Um, Tim Walker had been at the hospital for about 35 years. He still works there. He's worked in a few different roles. Uh, he was able to like look at certain pictures from like the 80s to now and say, oh, that's so and so, and that's so and so. So it dug through. Like I have a box on the floor in my office that is um, really bad, candid photos from like parties in the <laughs> 80s or so, and it's just. It's, it's great to look through. It doesn't really make for good displays because I don't know who the people are. I don't really know what the party is. So there's a lot of those types of things, but very sporadic. I don't have a ton of that. Um, and then I had a pretty nice archive of some of our, our newsletters. So we used to do a pretty broad community new newsletter. We um, paused that for a bit and then we restarted it um, and also now sunset it. Uh, so I had those and then some internal newsletters that kind of rooted some of our history. But beyond that, I like I didn't find much. And when I did find it, the stuff that I uncovered was what in like December of 2022, which I have an event in February. So some of this stuff was like, why didn't I had an intern last summer? Why didn't this turn up when I had an intern who could <laughs> dig through? So I have like eight or so banker boxes of things that are labeled invoices from XYZ dates and things that are labeled history from XYZ dates. And they were just so poorly organized and they still are. And I've dug through what I could and um, I brought some of that content to the museum um, for, for their archives. Um, but yes, it's, it's pretty haphazard. And um, my philosophy within that and the museum has encountered that is uh, I'm a bad curator, um, I'm a bad archivist, so museum should just take it all. <laughs> and so now, now if you need to research the hospital, don't come to me, come to Erica. So sorry, Erica. <laughs> Other questions, yeah. Do you have any tips for, you would mention organizations that are celebrating their 100th anniversary, yeah. maybe any tips on how they can get started or start organizing their own documents and photos? Hire somebody else. <laughs> uh, and I say that because I did. Uh, I had an intern that was solely dedicated to the research end of that, which for most of these organizations, you won't have a sole person to do the work. And that's, I still had my like standard work that fills my nine to five and then building this on top of that. So having an intern last summer that spent a lot of time uh, working with Erica and working with the collections here, um, organizing it and sorting that was really, really helpful. Um, and then I worked with um, an exhibit curator, um, Exhibits AK out of Juno, who has helped kind of curate some of this content. I had no idea where to start, right? Um, and so with their help, kind of outlined these themes. And so finding a theme, because I said, okay, we could do a timeline, 
but a timeline doesn't tell a story. Um, but the themes kind of did, and and we generated very much through the stories that we heard what those themes uh, really were. And so that would be like, what story do you want to tell? Do you want to tell the the different buildings you were in? Do you want to tell? Um, the different people who worked there, identify your themes and your core topic and kind of go from there and sort um, because you'll inevitably have a timeline, but that's just kind of boring. It's great, but it's also kind of boring. It doesn't tell your, your bigger uh, thematic response. Like for us, it's that symbiotic relationship between the community and the healthcare system. We wouldn't be what we were without each other. Um, and so that was the core that rose out of this. You mentioned the uh, upcoming museum exhibit at the yeah. hospital. What else do you guys have planned? This today. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, the, our, our initial plan, um, and let me pull this out. Uh, we did an initial kind of plan of bookending our historic storytelling with the community with two events. One was an event in February that was really highlighting our community partners and our caregivers. Um, and so community partners include people like EMS and um, the city of Ketchikan, obviously, local law enforcement, um, our caregivers from both locally and around the region. Um, most folks know this, but Peace Health is a, is a part of a system of 10 hospitals, and our mothership is in Vancouver, Washington. Um, our little hub is based out of Bellingham. So St. Joe's Hospital in Bellingham, Washington is where we get a lot of our resources and support. My boss is actually based out of Bellingham. Um, but we had a lot of those folks who came and celebrated with us in February. And then we're going to wrap up our um, celebration with a big community barbecue co-hosted with the city um, on August 11th. And that date, we picked um, kind of surrounded um, specific dates. February 22nd was the dedication day. And then August 11 is actually 60 years to the day of us um, moving into the hospital that we're in currently. And that dedication of the city kind of handing that over to uh, the sisters to operate, which I thought was really cool. So that's been 60 years in this 100 year history, uh, which is really neat. Uh, other things that we're doing is um, We'll, uh, we always do this, but we'll have a float during 4th of July, um, and then I'll do a little bit of an unveiling for that museum exhibit. I'm also taking this opportunity to do a few other like artsy projects. Um, I'm working with a photographer to kind of do a um, artistic re-envisioning of our women's diagnostic imaging suite, um, working with uh, them to get generations of women in our community to take some like family photos. So let's say your family has a um, big saner, and so I'm gonna get mom, grandbaby, great grandma, um, kind of around some sort of um, photojournalistic view and then um, incorporating that into kind of a, an art exhibit of sorts into the women's imaging suite. Uh, right now it's a pretty stark space and if you've been in there and you're in there for any sort of diagnostic test, sometimes that's an intimidating place to, to wait and so having some familiar faces and some family and um, I'm really looking forward to that. And then using that to kind of clean up some of our spaces and um, get us prepared to, many of you have noticed, uh, Peace Health is um, rebranding and so um, using that to clean up some of our walls and get uh, space ready to, to update our logo across the facility as well. So um, I think that covers what we've been also, um, I would be remiss not to plug uh, that KPU TV has been um, an instrumental partner in doing the interviews for our documentary, but then they also have been airing the documentary on the local channel, which I thought was really cool and such a great partnership. Um, and I made this comment to the um, to city council and to Lacey. Um, I was very surprised at the three city operated resources that um, were absolutely instrumental in, in this whole process. One, the museum here today, KPU TV, and then Ted Ferry Civic Center who really helped make a, a really fun event. Um, and those, those little tidbits were a surprising piece to me of like how cool this community is and the resources that we have available to us. Um, 
I, I've been lamenting. This week I've been trying to find, um, trying to rent tables and chairs for our August barbecue, right? And so I'm looking for where to rent tables and chairs and I'm like, that is one of the most difficult processes to rent <laughs> 120 chairs and, and 20 tables and find some place because no place rents them. But then all of these like other, like we've got a great hospital and we've got a great museum. We have these like nuggets of awesomeness um, in such a small community that we don't have enough like events to have a rental company, right? So like the perspective is just a little bit like when you when you look at it from that perspective, you're like wow, we really have a lot here for the size of town that we have, which is just it's been really cool to uncover that. And so um, yes, we will do our museum exhibit unveiling about June, Fourth of July parade in July, and then our community barbecue in August, and then um, I will take a break after that. <laughs> well deserved. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Kim, is there somewhere online where people can see the dates of some of these upcoming events and, and the material that you kind of presented today? Absolutely. So Facebook is um, a great resource. Uh, we do have a bit of a Facebook presence, as most places do here in Ketchikan. Uh, but also, I have a, a standing um, landing page, peacehealth.org slash 1923 is where a lot of our information is going. I'm just still trying to figure out a way to get our historic exhibit on our website, um, whether in these panel forms or otherwise. Um, but I think that that'll hopefully go up at some point in the coming months so people can kind of peruse uh, the coolness that is our historic exhibits. Uh, kind of speaking to that just a little bit, I, I I think of like the stories that I've learned about the hospital and I, I look at them as not stories about the hospital because they really aren't. They're really stories about the community and Tim Walker um, shared when he, in the, in the 90s or so, when we did blood banking here in Ketchikan, um, prior to a lot of the, the regulations and the testing that's now required for blood banking, some mass casualty event happened, right? No, not sure what it was, plane crash, whatever it might be, and they needed more blood than what we had banked. So there'd be a call out on the radio and say, hey, we need, we need blood donors. And there would be 30 or 40 people lined up out the door to donate blood within a matter of an hour or two. Uh, and those stories happened over and over and over again. I think about like the Grand Duke mine disaster. Sure, we were the hub of where um, that disaster. So for those of you who don't know, in 1965, there was an avalanche that happened in British Columbia. Because of the terrain, uh, Ketchikan was the closest location to base a response out of because of um, the weather and where the valleys were to access um, helicopters and, and flight paths. So we were the hub of response, though the, the actual incident was in British Columbia. And you had someone like Ken Eichner, again, not hospital, right? But he's like, gotta go, loads up his helicopter and flies on. You read his stories and he just like, he drops his helicopter down in the middle of nowhere, spends the night on the edge of like an avalanche field, gets up the next day and flies to the site. That's wild. Like these stories just don't happen um, on an everyday basis, but this is the resiliency of our community. And the just like, I think someone said it in the, when, when expletive hits the fan, we show up. And that's just the, the time and again, um, the stories that you hear is um, just showing up for each other. And I just thought that was so cool. Like this is um, the March of Dimes, right? I don't know everybody in, there, in this picture, but it was just a radio show and there was a big rally in the 50s for getting um, resources here to help support um, the polio epidemic. And March of Dimes was able to raise enough funds to get um, I think more than one iron lung here in Ketchikan, right? And we're a small town, that was in the 50s, and iron lung got flown or shipped up to Ketchikan when there were only about a thousand in the United States in total, and we had one or two up here as a, as a response. And that was because parents rallied together to say, hey, we need to take care of our kids. And we have a hospital that can help facilitate that, but really it was the community that rallied around. And those are the stories that come up time and again that, um, the the support and the resilience and the just awesomeness of our community. Uh, happy to tell other stories. I could I could rant on. Um, I'm I'm deeply ingrained into this process, um, and so. But I do hope that if you, uh, 
you take a little bit of a look at some of these panels and, and see some of the pictures. Just if nothing else, they're kind of interesting. Uh, there's, I'm certain that the folks who have been around Catch Can longer recognize some of these faces. Um, like there's in the 60s a picture of um, a class of assistant nurses who just got their pins or their hats or whatever it might be. So um, pretty cool. Other questions? All right. Um, well, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, yeah. for, oh, we got one? Oh, all right. Uh, yeah, we wanted to thank you for, uh, for sharing with us. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to go around and take a look at the panels and yeah. check out the website. We're going to load it there as well. Yeah. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing uh, your research and the journey to kind of celebrate the centennial of Peace Health Catch yep. again. All right. Uh, Great. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Thank you. Thank you.